In the end, MGS-1 is an important milestone for the medium thanks to a number of virtues and innovations. As Kojima writes in 1998's MGS Mission Handbook, quote, Incorporating the essence of movies in the game with no incongruity is what MGS is all about. End quote. The question then becomes how well the game meets this mission statement. Considering the limits of the technology, most of MGS1's playtime is spent watching cutscenes. What's happening? While there's a linear, literal, straight line leading you from beginning to end. The story, themes, and progression are, like any movie, set in stone by the creator. Yet consider, the more you call a member of your support team, for example, the more they open up about themselves over time. I was 10 years old on that day, April 26, 1986. You don't mean... Yes, Chernobyl. Have you ever heard this one? Confucius said it. Enough proverbs for now. I want to hear about you. You should be having fun, playing real video games instead of playing war. Some say that ravens have the power to predict death. Consider that each boss encounter forces a totally foreign set of requirements and weapons on the player, which pushes you over and over again out of your comfort zone. Consider how well-paced and dizzying the plot twists are, which keep you active and reacting to the story as a participant rather than spectator. Naomi, the chief, what happened? For me, these detail-oriented cases of game reactivity huh? Whose footprints are these? nicely complement the scripted movie-like sections. That's what MGS overall is truly built on. Balance huh? through contrast. Mr. Box. The stealth puzzles are balanced out by the boss fights and cinematics. The serious subject matter and poignant themes are balanced out by the comic book camp and anime style sci-fi and action. Do you think love can bloom even on a battlefield? Look out, Snake! The guys who stole my stealth prototypes are in there with you! With its endearing characters and unprecedented attention to detail within the story, design, mechanics, and world, MGS1 and its anti-nuke brand of Saturday morning existentialism was without question a new kind of game. It asked deeply profound questions on the nature of humanity, free will, scientific ethics, and the future of war and society. It features strong voice acting behind a cast of characters more diverse than any most games even have today. And most of all, MGS1 is just fun to play with a major caveat. When porting the game from Japan, Konami made an unfortunate decision. Fearing the American market of 1998 expected their M-rated action game to be hard as hell, Konami replaced the original's one and only difficulty setting with multiple options. Yet, for the sake of time and money, they simply rechristened the default setting as easy. Normal was really a poorly implemented, toughened up default while Hard took things to comical levels by simply removing the Soliton radar entirely. Considering this confusion, there's no denying the difficulty settings need retweaking. <laughs> and even on easy, today MGS1 can feel clunky, imprecise, and plain difficult. The genome soldiers seem to share a single hive mind because your cover is blown to the entire base if any one of them sees you. Playing stealthily is extra hard because the controls are configured to saddle high reward maneuvers with high risk, again in the name of balance, and it doesn't work as well on paper as in theory. To choke out a guard, for example, you have to hold square directly behind them without touching any of the movement controls. But if you don't take an extra second or two to be sure you aren't touching the analog stick or directional buttons, which you just use to position yourself, instead of choking the guard, Snake will give him a flip. And even if you're quick to cap him, it's a coin toss whether or not he dies without an alert at that point. It's similar with gunplay. Once you're pointing a small arm short of a full unequip, the only way to lower it without a shot is to gently let off the button without it registering as a press. I've heard of a hair trigger, but this is ridiculous. But the essence of movies, in Kojima's terms, 
entails more than realistic visuals or familiar tropes pulled from action blockbusters. As he explained to Time Magazine in 2014, quote, Through movies, I learned about political themes, cultural things, and economic factors I hadn't thought about before. I think part of my role, part of my duty, is to provide something similar to people through the games I create. End quote. The original Metal Gear Solid can no longer be called a state of the art. The very phrase itself conveys impermanence because, unlike movies, in games the state of the art is always expanding. Yet when it comes to MGS1's attempt to transplant the essence of movies across mediums, to exist as something more than mere entertainment, age hasn't slowed it down one bit. It's been said that the objective of an artist is to one day see their own work become obsolete. If that's right, it explains why a lot of what made MGS1 a big deal in 1998 might not seem that groundbreaking today. But there's no denying MGS1 was among the very first games in 3D to attempt a comprehensive simulation of a real physical environment. Gunshot sounds are echoey or thin, depending on whether you're inside or out. You leave tracks in the snow, make noise walking on grates, and open doors automatically with the right keycard. The environment, in other words, is interactive, reactive, and worth exploring in a way that only a game could be. This emphasis on realistic design extends to the weaponry, too. Whenever Metal Gear Solid deviates from realism into sci-fi, it's usually still rooted in the real world. The Nikita missile, for example, is smaller than the actual weapon it's based on. Stealth Camo has been in development for a while by the DoD, but it hasn't actually been field tested. No giant bipedal tank exists, but there's a real Livermore Labs that really creates new kinds of nukes through VR simulation and non-detonation tests. In short, nothing included in the game is completely unrealistic or fantastic. It all links back to reality. Not even the idea that DARPA and the Pentagon are involved in shadowy, monumental research with the potential to change the world is too far-fetched, in fact. According to the ACLU, the military has been sequencing its soldiers' genomes for years, while DARPA's Safe Genes Project is just one of an entire branch of research that DARPA calls SynBio, and the Pentagon, according to Popular Mechanics, calls Enhanced Human Operations. DARPA's been working on a brain-computer interface ever since 1985, when they developed a theoretical blueprint for a real-life exoskeleton-wearing cyborg. Clearly, Kojima did his homework. Even the location of Shadow Moses Island is no accident. Not only because the real Fox Archipelago exists quite literally on the margins of Western territory, more importantly, the chain of islands was occupied by the Japanese Empire during the Second World War. But these links back to the real world, crucially, resonate with the game's themes and big ideas. Each of the things I just mentioned, the military's interest in genetic engineering, DARPA's exoskeleton, and the Fox Archipelago's role in World War II, can be traced back to a unifying common ground. That common ground is the relationship between American hegemony and science. Since World War II, America has used science both as a carrot and a stick to maintain geopolitical power. DARPA itself was formed in the wake of Sputnik to ensure the Soviets would never upstage American science and research again. Medical breakthroughs and biological discoveries have kept the English language the world's dominant lingua franca by making our language too useful and beneficial to ignore. Just as our constantly expanding technological arms race with Russia played a pivotal role in crippling the Soviet Empire by draining its resources, funds, and attention. In short, the same science improving our lives is also the science we use to maintain forceful dominance over the world. This is why Oppenheimer, one of the fathers of the atomic bomb, said that by creating such a weapon, science had tasted sin and, like Adam's exile from Eden, could never return to its former innocence. Speaking of the Bible, MGS1 is full of references to that foundational text of Western thought, which, like the setting on the Fox Archipelago, conveys the endless return of phantoms from the past. By imposing these traces of history and memory onto the story, MGS1 implicitly rejects the core ideal of the American dream, by showing that nothing really erases the past or resets the calendar to year zero. Things in life don't cease to exist simply by moving away and ignoring them, <clears throat> or holding a separate set of truths to be self-evident. History repeats itself time and time again. 
Let my people go! It's fitting, for example, the crisis plays out on an island called Shadow Moses. Like Moses, Liquid Snake seeks to liberate his people with a threat of awesome power. And like the biblical Naomi, Dr. Hunter is embittered by bereavement. Like the biblical David, Dave, aka Snake, takes on a Goliath, only to narrowly avoid being killed by the very political power he fought for. Ironically, however, it's the surrogate Pharaoh in the story who weaponizes the plague with the miraculous ability of killing off only its enemies. What I've just tried to demonstrate is that MGS1's artistic relevance and power stems from the way that it syncs up its form and its content. Nothing is present without a link to the game's central ideas. Everything is connected to form a single, solid form of artistic expression. You mustn't allow yourself to be chained to fate, to be ruled by your genes. Humans can choose the type of life they want to live. The important thing is that you choose life. And then live. Yes, sir. The entire unit was wiped out. Those two are still alive. The vector? Yes, sir. Fox dies should become activated soon. Right on schedule. Yes, sir. I recovered all of Rex's dummy warhead data. No, sir. My cover is intact. Nobody knows who I really am. Yes, the DARPA chief knew my identity, but he's been disposed of. Yes, the inferior one was the winner after all. That's right. Until the very end, Liquid thought he was the inferior one. Yes, sir, I agree completely. It takes a well-bounced individual such as yourself to rule the world. No, sir. No one knows that you were the third one, Solidus. What should I do about the woman? Yes, sir. I'll keep her under surveillance. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Mr. President.